give um, this ACS talk part one. We'll give a, another talk um, regarding ACS more aligned towards STEMI care or part two, uh, maybe even next week, I think. Um, and we gave these, I gave these talks or some of these talks, some modification of that last year. Um, so I'm going to try to get through a fair amount of data. I, this is directed towards um, the residents and the fellows, uh, any intendings that, that are on. Uh, I think that's fantastic, but I'm directing it more towards um, trying to keep things basic um, and simple and, and really talk about how we got to where we are um, and how I like to approach um, these patients, how I think about them. Um, so during the talk, feel free to, to jump in, interrupt. It looks like I'm seeing um, the chat box up there. So if you either send it by chat or just open up, um, that's fine. And, and question me. I want you guys to question me. Like, why the heck are you saying that? Someone else says this. Um, I think that's great to, to have that sort of dialogue. All right. So we'll start off with a case. Um, JB is an 87 year old female that does have hypertension and COPD who comes to their ER with one episode of chest discomfort the day prior to admission. She's chest pain free in the ER. She weighs 53 kilos. That's her blood pressure, 160s over 70s, heart rate of 102, the, the, the ever present, ever present respiratory rate of 20. Um, and 98% on two liters. On exam, you actually hear some about basal arousal, although she has no evidence of volume overload. Otherwise, on exam, no peripheral edema. The meds she's on are HCTZ, that Aricept should get your attention, a multivitamin and calcium and vitamin D. Her EKG does have a uh, sinus tack, uh, one or two, um, with some LVH, but no acute SCT wave changes. And her labs show a hemoglobin of 11, her sodium is 138, creatinine to 1.5. I would advise you to calculate her GFR um, with that age, that weight, and her creatinine. And her troponin I is 0 0.2, and, and that's why they called you guys acutely to, to, to evaluate this person. So the first question I have is, what is the diagnosis? Um, and second question is, what, what do you want to do, right? That's what we're often trying to come up with when you're the first one going to see this person. And what you want to do, I think, is dependent upon number. Sorry, dependent upon number one. What is the diagnosis? You first have to make the diagnosis. And I would argue I'm not quite sure what the diagnosis is at this point. Um, what are the alternative causes and diagnoses? Um, and then you have to ask the question, well, what is the benefit, what the benefit of therapy is, right? Whether it's medicine or intervention. And this is related to the risk of the diagnosis. So you first have to make the diagnosis if it isn't treated. In other words, is she at high risk for an event from the presumed diagnosis? The second question is, what is the risk of treatment? Oh, let's go back to that. So weighing these two things is, is very important, but the first thing starts with what the diagnosis is. And I'm going to partly make the case that just that uh, indeterminate troponin does not make the diagnosis. So now we'll talk about ACS in general. What's the epidemiology of ACS? Well, we know how common it is, right? We get lots of consults on this. We see lots of patients. So almost 800,000 folks a year in the U.S. are admitted with an ACS. The median age is 68. That's going up every year. Um, more males than females. Um, about 70% of these patients are non-STEMIs or unstable angina, and about, therefore about 30% of these are STEMIs, okay? Interestingly, the comorbidities are higher in patients with non-STEMI versus STEMI, um, so that's something to keep in note. And, and the hallmark of an ACS, sudden imbalance between myocardial consumption and demand, usually related to a coronary artery obstruction, usually. So this falls on a spectrum, and I know um, you fellows know this, the senior fellows, trying not to insult your intelligence, but we're just starting simple. Um, so there's a whole spectrum, right? And it, it ranges from the patient with unstable angina, they haven't ruled in, and the person with a positive troponin uh, then falls into the non-STEMI range. Somewhere in here is the indeterminate troponin, which may or may not be related to the an ACS, and then obviously the STEMI. And this is a, sort of a schematic that sort of speaks to the progression of this, basically. As we know, over time, basically, we're trying to manage these patients prior to any ACS as everybody develops these uh, plaques in our coronary arteries. 
um, of positive remodeling. It sometimes eventually can cause some luminal obstruction, but even before that occurs, you can have a plaque eruption, plaque erosion, acute thrombus, and that's where the acuity comes in. We're trying to determine whether this is happening in someone's coronary artery that can cause their symptoms. Uh, after this occurs, or after we have a, a known buildup of plaque, now you have more of a stable plaque and you're just trying to uh, keep this from happening again. That's term as, I, as you guys know, secondary prevention, long-term management. So you get called to see somebody with chest pain. Okay, what's our initial evaluation? I stole this from the ACC. I stole a couple of these slides from ACC. So the first question is, are there symptoms suggestive of an ACS? Okay, sometimes it's easy and obvious. Sometimes this is a definite ACS. Clearly they're coming and clutching their chest. They have ST elevations. That's an easy one. This is also kind of an easy one. They have definite symptoms of an ACS. They have substernal chest pressure every time they've been walking. Then in a prolonged episode, they come in, they still have a little bit of symptoms and they, they have no ST elevation, but they have some, you know, ST depression. Their troponins are positive. This is easy. Okay, this is easy as well. You admit them and they use these guidelines for non-ST elevations. Okay, then there's, this is the harder side over here, right? You're not quite sure. Possibly ACS. You're not sure about their symptoms. They have some features which are concerning, some aren't. And their EKGs are negative and are, are unremarkable. Their biomarkers are negative. What do you do? Okay, and this is sort of the area we're going to be focusing on how do you go about treating these folks? Okay, I'm not going to go through this right now. But the other, you know, point that this slide doesn't address is, you know, this is how we often get called, right? We get often get called with, oh, well, there's a positive troponin, and we have to explain it. And what I want to try and get you guys to avoid in talking about this is automatically going from here to here, that all quote unquote positive troponins get labeled as an ACS or a non-STEMI, because if so, then all, the, all of a sudden you go straight down to this and you treat them as a non-STEMI. And we have to really avoid this, this easy sort of path um, to jump right up there. Sometimes our job is to explain a troponin. So that gets us to a Timmy risk score, because I hear this all the time, partly because it's in the, in the guidelines, it's written in there, but I think it's used incorrectly. And I just, let's just sort of talk about it. Um, so um, the Timmy risk score is made up of all of these things down here. I think you guys know. So older age, they have more than three risk factors for coronary disease. They have a known obstructive coronary disease, whether they've been stented before or had bypass surgery before or just on angiography. And then um, whether they have ST deviation on EKG, if they have more than one event, they're on aspirin in the prior seven days, or if they have positive biomarkers, we'll just say a positive troponin. And based on the increased number of these, their Timmy risk score goes up. What does that mean? Well, what that means is that their, their event rate is higher um, as the Timmy risk score goes up. This is not the same as saying the higher the risk score, the more likely their symptoms are ischemic. And I'm just going to talk about that for a second. And also, and, and the other thing to point out is really the two things that drive the score has been looked at many times are the presence of ST elevations and elevated car cardiac biomarkers. Those are really the two most important features that drive this increased event rate. So that, that's why we pay attention to these so much. Okay. So let's go back to, to guidelines again, back to the ACC. Um, and I wanna point out what we sort of talk about. And this is what we talked about at the very beginning, basically. Um, the first thing you have to, you ask yourself two questions. What is the likelihood of obstructive coronary disease that that obstructive coronary disease is the cause of their symptoms? And then trying to determine what to do, you have to ask yourself, what's the risk of a bad outcome? Another way to ask this is, does this patient have symptoms due to acute ischemia from coronary disease, obstructive coronary disease? And then what is the likelihood of death and my heart failure? given this diagnosis. Okay, so if we step through this, and the reason I brought this up is I actually like this slide from ACC, um, because when you're trying to figure out whether their symptoms could be due to obstructive coronary disease, um, they're dominated by acute findings. Really, the exam is, is, is less helpful, let's be honest, unless they're an obvious heart failure, unless you hear an AS murmur. Um, the symptoms are really absolutely key. And, and this is the other thing I wanted to bring up. Traditional risk factors are, are of limited utility. 
And this is where nuance comes in. And I sort of want to, this is why you get paid the big bucks as a cardiologist, right? Is, is that it's, it's hard to tease out what these symptoms are from, but that's our job. Just saying, well, they had chest pain two days ago, they had chest pain last week, or they had chest pain this morning. You know, if you've, if you've heard one person's description of chest pain, you've heard one person's description of their chest pain. You have to get into the details, into the meat. What brought it on? What were you doing? What did it happen? What made it go away? How long did it last? What exactly did it feel like? Tell me your story. Tell me your story. I want to hear your story. Um, because um, everybody's chest pain is, is, is different. Everybody's story is different. And what you can't do is use these risk factors to say, oh, their chest pain must be ischemic because they have a lot of risk factors. And this is the first time I've ever seen this written there by anybody in the ACC, and I'm so happy they did. Um, please don't use their risk factors to determine that whether or not you think their chest pain is coming from obstructive coronary disease. They're really a very limited utility. So this is sometimes what, 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 what I see, and I just want to make sure, um, not from anybody on this, on this uh, uh, talk, but um, sometimes you'll see that somebody comes in with quote unquote chest pain, okay? And they calculate their Timmy or Grace risk score. And I'm seeing this more and more as this has been put into the guidelines as to help guide how aggressive to be. And their Timmy or Grace risk score is fairly high. So therefore this must be cardiac. And therefore, I think we need to stress or cap them. Um, and, and I just want to sort of push us away from that. Okay, same thing. You get called for a positive troponin. The troponin is abnormal. Maybe it's only indeterminate. Well, they have a we calculate their Timmy and Grace risk score, which is high. Therefore, this must be a non-STEMI. Therefore, let's let's cap them because their Timmy risk score is high. Um, and again, I want to sort of push us away from this. Okay. And this gets to the, the difference between algorithmic versus heuristic thinking, okay? I don't know if any of you guys know what those terms mean. I think most of you do, but if not, just go back and look at the definition. But in short, algorithmic uses sort of set of steps to try and lead you to a typical solution, whereas heuristic um, requires a sort of novel way or different way of thinking about or coming about up with either a new solution or a diagnosis. And I would argue that the evaluation of chest pain cannot be algorithmic for us. Um, it needs to be heuristic. You need to get into the meat of it. You need to ask the details, the nuances of this person's sort of symptoms. Um, I'm glad we have algorithms. I'm glad we have algorithms for chest pain evaluations in the ER because it can screen a large number of people and show that they're actually low risk. But when we get called, we can't use these simple algorithms. We can't just calculate their Timmy or Grace risk score and use that to say, well, this must be cardiac. We need to also ask lots of questions to try and come up with what else it might be. If it's not cardiac, that can be very helpful. And we need to always think about other life-threatening conditions. Um, and I've written PE three times there because this is gonna happen a lot, okay? It's gonna be, the is gonna be abnormal. They had some sort of chest pain. We didn't maybe do a good job of ask me about those chest pain symptoms and, and a PE is gonna be missed. And so don't ever miss that. Also aortic dissection. If you don't know what a penetrating aortic ulcer is, I, I would go look it up, but that can present like an ACS and, and you'll probably see those one or two of those in your career. Um, you wanna to try to not miss that. Plenty of pneumothorax, hopefully a chest X-ray is not gonna miss that, but even pancreatitis can often be um, mislabeled as an ACS when they first come in. There's lots of non-life-threatening ones from a hernia to GERD, peptic ulcer disease, esophageal spasm, uh, cholecystitis or lithiasis. That, that's an incredibly common one um, that is often mislabeled as an ACS because they also have associated nausea, they don't feel well, um, and so it gets labeled. And so, and, and I've seen way too many cases of, of zoster uh, being labeled as, um, as a potential ACS or unstable engine. Um, so this just briefly goes back to the, the GRACE score. So, so this points out that there's lots of different things you need to be thinking about, lots of different things you have to be asking about and looking for. Um, and if we just throw in this, this GRACE score, you know, what is the GRACE score? Well, this is a pretty complicated sort of situation that in the, in the heat of the, the, the matter in the, in the ER, for instance, 
I think if we're running this sort of algorithm to try and come up with a grace score number to determine what their non-STEMI um, post ditchworth mortality is in six months, then, then we're not we're not doing the right thing. This is layered onto somebody already with a diagnosis of non-STEMI to determine what the risk is over the next six months. What this should be used for um, is to help determine, I don't know if you guys can see this, this is overlaying it, um, how aggressive to be. If they're low risk, maybe you don't need to be aggressive. If they're high risk, you probably should be aggressive as long as their, their, their risk is not high of the, the treatment. But this is only after you've made the appropriate diagnosis. So that's what I'm gonna keep going back to. What I want you to remember are these things, okay? Because the GRACE risk score is, again, sometimes labeled, layered on top of it after the diagnosis. But as far as knowing what to do in the short term, in the ER, for instance, I want you to keep, um, remember these. And these are a little more clinically helpful um, because it tells you, well, this is a high risk situation. I need to do something sooner rather than later. Maybe I need to get somebody involved sooner rather than later. I need to treat them more aggressively sooner rather than later. And those are accelerating tempo or prolonged ongoing pain. That's always a concern. They have hemodynamic instability or evidence of heart failure. Um, even if they don't have ST elevations, that is a concerning sign. They have dynamic ST changes. Don't worry about the T wave changes really so much. Um, if they're having VT, that's concern. And obviously, elevated cardiomyopathy. These are the things that should get your attention, even in the absence of ST elevation. And it's a lot easier to remember than this. Okay, so let's go to troponins. What is this, what is this troponin thing? And I think sometimes um, it's a good idea to step back and sort of uh, understand uh, a troponin and understand what all can cause them to be elevated. And, and what is an MI, this, this is from ACC, what is an MI in 2018? Okay, the question is, is it related to cardiac injury um, or not? Okay, if the troponin is elevated, but it's chronic and flatly elevated, then they're saying, think of structural heart disease, renal disease. Okay, what if there's an acute elevation? It was initially fairly normal, it went up and or came down. Next question, is there an ischemic mechanism? No, there's no ischemic mechanism. Well, maybe they're simply in heart failure, maybe this is a PE, there are other causes. Okay, well, we think there is an ischemic mechanism, but quote unquote, whose fault is it, right? Is it picture consistent with a plaque rupture, that's an easy one, right? That's what we call a type one MI. But this is probably the more common situation or as common situation, um, what we now call a type two MI as of 2018, the fourth universal definition of MI, where yes, maybe there's an ischemic mechanism because they have underlying obstructive coronary disease, but the precipitant is they're in rapid AFib, their hemoglobin is seven and a half, their blood pressure is 220 over 120, something else that is causing a mismatch between uh, supply and demand is another way we talk about this. This is a type 2 MI. Another way to talk about this is, you know, what is the spectrum of myocardial injury? I actually don't like that they use this term injury as much because there's some lots of data now that a odd normal troponin doesn't necessarily cause myocardial cause You don't have to have myocardial cell death to have elevated troponin, okay? But in the spectrum of it, this is no injury. Things that cause hypoxemia, anemia, VTAC, heart failure, kidney disease um, can blend into it and cause an elevated troponin um, and myocardial injury, but they're not associated with acute ischemic events. So it's only this central area that we really wanna focus on that can um, be brought about by some of these things. That's what they're sort of re talking about here. It's reaching into or stepping into. Um, the reason I brought bring this up is not all troponin releases is, is 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 injury, and I really think this is something we don't talk about enough. Even since this fourth universal de definition, I, I think it's probably going to change when we come up with the fifth universal definition, which may be five, four or five years from now. But uh, recently reading some stuff about you know sports cardiology, and and there's amazing data out there. Just the simple act of running, and this isn't, you know, you're running ultra marathons, but uh, for instance, get away from marathons, they did a study of, of professional soccer players, young kids in their, you know, early 20s, just during when they're practicing, and they measured their troponins 24 hours after their last practice, 
Um, and two thirds of them had elevated troponins. They're in the indeterminate range for the most part, but they were not normal. Those are, that is not injury. Um, and there are some evidence that maybe there's a cytosolic pool, pool of troponin that might get released during some of these activities. But um, I don't like the fact that in this day and age, even in 2020, from the fourth universal definition, any elevated troponin is still considered myocardial injury. So what are the reasons or things that can cause elevation of cardiac troponin? Again, because of myocardial injury is, is what they're saying. Um, the top one is the one we're worried about and we, we treat, we're gonna talk about how to treat that. That's injury related to acute myocardial ischemia related to plaque disruption or thrombosis, okay. But then there's the injury related to, yes, ischemia, but it's due to an oxygen supply demand imbalance, i.e. type two, um, type two MI. And that can be from either reduced myocardial perfusion or from increased demand. That's from sustained tachyarrhythmias, rapid AFib, BT, severe hypertension with or without LVH, okay? But if you go back up to here, even the type two MIs, in other words, not from plaque disruption or thrombosis, but these still often need to be treated as an ACS. And sometimes you can't make this diagnosis until after the catheters. And so not all, it's not just type one MIs that, that, that for instance, need to be cath. We can't just quote unquote, blow off all type two MIs. And they're labeling the, the mismatch between oxygen supply and demand can still happen from a coronary dissection, coronary embolism. You can't make those diagnoses um, usually uh, without a cath. And so, you know, the, the point of this is not to say all type two MIs need to be sort of pushed aside and, 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 and uh, forgotten about, so to speak, but just understand that it's not all from plaque disruption or thrombosis. Um, and we need to think about all these other things that could be occurring. Usually you treat the underlying condition. Okay, and then there's other causes. Again, they use the term injury. I don't really like this. Um, from heart failure to myocarditis, I'll just put out COVID anybody, um, Takasubos, um, after a calf, after cabbage, after an ablation. And then there's all these other systemic conditions. These are cardiac conditions. These are systemic conditions, including 11 they put strenuous exercise. And I think this concept of it has to be really strenuous ultra marathon exercise is, is now being debunked even further, basically. So what are the criteria for type 1 MI? Well, you have to detection a rise and fall of the cardiac uh, troponin with at least one value above the, nine, above the 99th percentile. You have to have symptoms of acute myocardial ischemia. Most important issue, most important issue, okay? Having new ischemic EKG changes is helpful to diagnosis. Obviously, if you have new pathologic Q waves, that kind of makes this sort of easy and you're probably late, late to the game. Then having imaging of new loss of biomyocardium, new regional wall motion, um, in a pattern consistent with ischemic etiology, or if you find it at cath, that's an easy one. This shows plaque rupture erosion, lucid thrombus. These are the ones we're looking out for. These are the ones we're going to treat aggressively with medical therapy initially. Type 2 MI. Okay. Um, I, I like, here's their criteria for type 2 MI. <clears throat> Still have a rise and fall, but this is in the setting of an imbalance between oxygen supply and demand. And you require symptoms of acute ischemia. You can still have chest pain, obviously, with hemoglobin of 7 and AFib with a heart rate of 130. That in no way could be with underlying obstructive coronary disease. It doesn't mean that's the primary abnormality. If you treat the anemia and or the rapid AFib, their symptoms go away. That's the underlying cause. You, you can even have new ischemic EK change agents. You can have pathologic Q waves. You can have all of these things. Uh, but the cause of it is usually there's some obstructive coronary disease, but you can also have vasospasm. You can have dissection. Um, and you can have really just, as this implies, severe imbalance of supply and demand with normal coronary arteries. This is usually the exception. Almost everybody's got some degree of atherosclerosis, especially the older we get. Um, and often, if we, if we don't pay attention to the fact that there's something underlying going on, whether it's severe anemia, hypertension, heart failure, um, and, and they have underlying coronary disease, which may have contributed, but wasn't the primary abnormality, you know, you, you take them to cath because you just go, you're in your algorithmic sort of um, way of thinking 
And at Cath, you see obstructive coronary disease. It's it's not a stretch to then say, oh, I found the problem. Let's fix the problem. Whereas that wasn't the underlying problem. And that's why this 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 understanding and, and trying to figure out if they really have symptoms or not and what the underlying issues might be is so helpful because if you just go there straight to cath you're going to see a lot of coronary disease in folks okay and that's where this i love i use this term that nobody else uses but i like to call it infocad and some of you guys have heard this from me okay what does that stand for that's the incidental finding of obstructive coronary disease at cath okay this happens all the time and the implication is, oh, I found obstructive coronary disease. Clearly, that was the problem. That was the that was the primary abnormality that led to the findings. And and that is um, often um, illogical thinking, in my opinion. Um, but it's often the case um, if we um, jump straight to cath, because if you find coronary disease, what does it mean, really? I would have to ask the question: What does it really mean? Um, and if you treat the underlying uh, cause, whether it be tachyarrhythmia or their severe anemia, their severe hypertension, their sepsis, um, that's usually what's most important. And you, you could argue, well, it's a good thing we found the obstructive coronary disease because we're able to do something about it. In 2020, I really don't think you can make that argument anymore. And I, I would argue that you've never been able to make that argument. but. For the most part, the medical community has somewhat been scared that we can't let anyone walk around with obstructive coronary disease. And I, and I would raise the question, you know, how many more trials do we have to have that show that medical therapy is just as good as revascularization in most settings, in the non-acute setting? Um, so I'll just, we could have an entire talk about this. I'm not going to sort of go any further. Uh, so briefly, this is sort of the working backwards sort of view, right? We get called with a troponin, uh, and we have to work backwards and say, well, where did this come from, basically? Okay, well, the troponin level has been stable for a long period of time. That doesn't make any sense. This is just sort of chronic injury, so to speak, from their kidney disease or structural heart disease. They did have a rise and fall, but it was without any, without any acute ischemia. You know, is this myocarditis? Again, COVID era has changed our thinking about this or... or um, change our sensitivity to this, but it is with ischemia. And then the question is, okay, was this from a type, from an oxygen supply mismatch? Or do we think this is really from atherosclerosis and thrombosis as the primary event? Based on that, here's our, here's our hospital management. Okay, we're really directed at the type one MI. Okay, so yes, you're gonna monitor them. Treatment with aspirin, control or rate pressure product, you're going to anticoagulate them. We'll talk about that. And then the question is, do we add a 2B3 inhibitor? Do we add clopidogrel? Um, and, and there are two different paths. And this is where I start talking about the two different paths. Um, again, I think in certain centers, um, it's, it's, there, there's a favoring towards everybody, no matter what. If they get labeled as unstable angina, especially non STEMI, you just go straight to an early invasive strategy because quote unquote, that's best. And we're gonna talk about that. But there are clearly two paths that we need to talk about. One is yes, going to an early invasive strategy. The other is, is referred to here as an early conservative strategy, although I'd like to change the term to, and they'll use it other ways, is to a selective invasive strategy. Meaning that you only go to cath if they recurrent symptoms, they're in heart failure, they have arrhythmias, what have you basically, um, or They've stabilized and their stress test is abnormal or they've got, you, your healthy function is reduced. Okay, maybe you cath them then, but they have to fail something over here before you uh, actively uh, look at their coronary arteries, basically. And we'll talk about why you would do one thing versus the other. First thing in an early basis strategy you have to decide is do they need to go immediately to cath? This is even for, this is a non-STEMI or can we wait? Most of the folks who want to wait, but you need to be aware of these folks that need to go in the first two hours, okay? And those are the, have those risk factors that we talked about about They have ongoing symptoms. They're in heart failure. They're having ventricular arrhythmias, not necessarily the positive troponins. They're sitting there with ongoing resting ST changes. Those are folks that are at high risk and you need to be thinking about them differently and they need to be going to cath sooner rather than later. Gray score is not involved there. 
popped this in recently, just after John was telling me about something, you know, why there are lots of reasons why we go down this path. Okay. One of them might be that they just left AMA recently. Okay. And, and I'm not going to take them to Kathy because if I put a stent in, I don't know if they're going to leave AMA again and not take their medicines. And then they're going to thrombose that stent that I just put in there. And they're going to have a much bigger MI than if I treated them conservatively. It doesn't mean that I'm not going to cap them, but sometimes we, people have to prove to me that that's the right thing to do because when I get there and find their coronary disease, the question is, what am I going to do about it? What am I going to safely do about it? And what this slide is, is trying to, to convince you guys that, that going to a selective invasive strategy is not hurting people, is not killing people. Okay, this is a slide, again, from ACC that is trying to, is looking at this um, uh, meta-analysis of a bunch of trials that were compared early invasive, early invasive versus conservative therapy. And what they're showing here, is say we pull them all together, and we're saving lives, okay? And for the most part, we are. This is why most of the time for a non-STEMI, we are sending them to cath without waiting around and doing stress tests or, or, or doing anything else. Um, but there's really, no, there's if you look at the individual trials, um, it's not as strong and compelling evidence as, as, as you would think. And I just want you to know some of these things, okay? So this started with, Really, it started with Vanquish. Okay, they don't even have the Vanquish trial on here because guess what? In Vanquish, it came out in 1998, Pris 2 came in 99. There wasn't any difference. There are problems with the trial. It was a VA trial. They had a higher incidence of, of MI and death in their cabbage group. And they said, oh, folks in the VA don't know how to do bypass surgery. Okay, Pris 2 came out in 99 and it was quote unquote positive, showing a benefit for early invasive versus conservative therapy. Okay, and that is true. Okay, and trials since then have been fairly consistent. This is really just looking at mortality, but this, this, this slide bothers me for a couple of different reasons. One of which is that we need to understand the data a little bit better. And I'm gonna to get to this in a little bit. If you just, all you do is memorize guidelines and don't really know the underlying data behind it, it's hard to sort of think critically about things, okay? The biggest one we always talk about, first two, oh, it's positive, everybody should get cath rather than conservative therapy. Well. Do we know, do the people on this talk hopefully are going to know now, that you could even get into FRIS-2 if you were 76 years old? How many patients do we cap that are, that are for small non-STEMIs that are 85, 88 years old? Okay, they were not in this group, okay? Um, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. The other thing that bothers me is they're cherry-picking this data, okay? The RITA-3 trial was not a five-year trial, okay? There, in the RITA-3 trial, there was no difference at one or three years in the conservative versus early invasive therapy. They're, they're throwing in the five-year data for the RITA-3 just in mortality and then comparing six-month data here and six-month data here and one-month data here. This is really a, a, a slide that was put together by somebody trying to prove a point. Um, but here are the curves. The primary co-primary endpoint of RITA-3 MI and cardiovascular death was no different at one year and actually it was no different at, at two years and was trending towards a bit of a difference um, only at three years. Um, so, and actually when you look at this is all death, um, cardiovascular death was no different. So the point is not to stop capping people. What I'm trying to bring up is that if you, if there's a reason to proceed down a selective invasive therapy, you're not killing people. You're not doing them a disservice. You're being thoughtful and using nuance to your approach. So I started looking up um, the, the data when I, when I went back and looked at a lot of these older patients who are not even allowed in these trials. Um, and actually there's a, there's a article from the Journal of Geriatric Cardiology. I didn't even know there's a Journal of Geriatric Cardiology. And, and uh, Manish, I think, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put you, I think this is maybe a good thing to talk about at some point. You can uh, bring it up in Journal Club, or, but there's a little bit of data out there talking about, well, should we using this same, uh, I will say no brainer sort of approach to invasive strategy in elderly patients who actually have a non-STEMI? What, what is the right answer? And I'm not gonna go into this because it's beyond the scope of this talk, but I think it's worth further discussion. I'm just going to put that out there. Okay. The other thing in these older folks, I think, as we're talking about that, 
what I think we need to do is weigh this risk versus benefit. If I'm telling you that the benefit is borderline, it's, it's positive in large numbers of patients, but if the benefit is somewhat borderline, but the risk is elevated for whatever reason, maybe the risk benefit is balances itself out and maybe the risk outweighs the benefit in some folks, right? Um, so what are the increased risk of ischemia? Well, some of them are the same risks as their increased risk of bleeding, basically, older age, renal insufficiency, female sex, okay, low body weights, history of bleeding, anemia. So we have to, the, the, the good cardiologist, in my opinion, weighs each side of this equation and knows the data behind these trials and, and can weigh it appropriately. Just sort of bring up briefly, so, so what's the big deal of bleeding, right? What's the big deal? Okay, so this is the ADAPT DES trial. And they looked at, okay, everybody got a DES and they followed them afterwards. And these were non STEMIs and I believe stable angina as well. So if they had um, an MI after their DES placed, what was their two year mortality? Okay, so it was double. It's not good to have a heart attack after your DES is put in, okay, whether it's from another vessel, whether it's stent thrombosis, it's not good. What do you think their risk of death was if they had a, a significant bleed after the DES was put in? Do we have any, any takers out there? Anybody? John? Mansoor? Uh, three, three times. Yeah, five times. So when some of us bring up, they just had a bleed recently, or a person's high risk for bleeding, and and somebody scoffs at it. I, I think we should maybe start thinking about that a little, a little bit more concerningly. Okay, if and why is this so high? We don't know why it's so high. It's probably a marker of of their underlying comorbidities, but also means that we have to stop their antiplatelets, and and then they're more likely a thrombose, and then they they, they have a high risk of dying. So really need to think about this uh, more consistently. And sometimes that's a reason not to rush straight to a cath, but sometimes sort of thinking about what's going on here in this 87 year old individual who's on Aricept and weighs 53 kilos and crack is 1.5. This is our patient at the beginning. Dr. Robinson? Yes. Trini, hey. Sorry, there's a lot of uh, resound. So is this access site bleeding or non-access site bleeding that, no, this, that this was is, looked into and associated with higher mortality. Yeah, this is a pretty consistent finding. In this trial, it was saying, okay, after their discharge, this is after it was put in. So over the next um, event, you know, what is the likelihood? So this, again, post-discharge event, this is afterwards. This is not acutely. It's a good question. Because acutely, that's been shown many times, basically. You're right, that in the acute setting, if they bleed in the hospital, whether it's access site bleeding or other, their mortality is increased. And that's what's sort of gotten us away from, for instance, using 2B3 inhibitors. We know that those, those patients have a much higher risk. We try to keep them from bleeding acutely. This is after their discharge. Really good question. Okay. So briefly, what time is it? How much am I babbling? 8.40. Okay. So I, I know you guys really want to know guidelines. I know for boards, you need to know guidelines. Um, and so we're going to talk about medical treatment for unstable angina and unstemmy, how you treat these folks beforehand. But I, this, I wrote this down, and I, uh, I'm trying not to be condescending by saying this, but, but, but trees, please try not to just memorize the guidelines. You need to use the guidelines. That they're going to reference the trials. Go down, back and look at some of these trials and actually try to know the data a little bit. Uh, from which they are derived, because if you don't, you, I don't think you can critically understand them, and you can't really apply them to your, in an appropriate manner to your individual patient, okay? Guidelines are guidelines, that's it. So here's the guideline, lots of guidelines, okay, and I'll just point to this, okay. So finally, they updated this. Only give them oxygen if they're hypoxemic, okay? Um, we won't go into that too much, but it took them decades to finally say that. Um, even though the, every piece of data ever looked at, especially in the pediatric literature, showed that their outcomes are probably worse. Um, it's from free radical generation and what have you. Um, nitrate. So you're going to give them nitroglycerin um, 
for continuing ischemic pain, and then you need to assess their, their role for IV nitroglycerin, okay? If they're having ongoing pain to the point where you need to start IV nitroglycerin, especially if it doesn't go away right away, that's a high-risk person, right? Ongoing chest pain. So putting them on IV nitroglycerin and walking away is not a good idea. So this has changed. Uh, IV morphine, it basically says, may be reasonable for continued ischemic pain, um, but it's a 2B recommendation. Basically, 2B to me means you have to justify why you're doing it. 2A means you have to just, what, justify to some degree why you're not doing it. 2B means justify why you're doing it. And there's more and more data showing that IV morphine may be associated with reduced absorption of some of the PO meds we give. Um, in essence, um, we try to avoid it nowadays, so you can use it, but you kind of have to show why you're doing it. Beta blockers, you should then give them in the, um, in the first 24 hours, unless they're in heart failure or low output state and clearly not in cardiogenic shock. So beta blockers have gotten a bit of a bad rap in the setting of STEMIs and non-STEMIs. I would argue because they were used at high doses and given to everybody regardless of their clinical state. Um, the Chinese trial was a ridiculous trial, in my opinion that never should have been published or never should have been done. And they gave high doses, no matter whether they're in cardiogenic shock or not. Shock or not. And guess what? They didn't do well. Um, so please use them as long as they're clinically appropriate. Okay. You can use calcium channel blockers to reduce uh, ischemic symptoms, especially when beta blockers are not successful or contraindicated for whatever reason. Okay. You're reducing their double product. And then everybody should be getting high intens intensity statin. Okay. Everybody, that's a class 1A, that's, 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 that's a no-brainer. So further detail. So aspirin initially, all patients, you, give, you don't start off with 81, you get them 162 to 325 initially for at least one day, some would argue three to five days. And then the P2Y2 2 inhibitors, I'm not gonna go too much into this, but I will a little bit later. But uh, in the setting of especially positive troponins or STT wave changes, um, folks should get either dual antiplatelet therapy or the 2B3 inhibitor. We're not using these much anymore. There's the 2B um, because there's probably not much added benefit in the setting of dual antiplatelet therapy and an invasive management um, sort of uh, trial. They have, they have, they have uh, increased, significantly increased bleeding risk. They're very effective. Every single patient, when I was a fellow who had a positive troponin, I got put on 2B3 inhibitors and IV heparin. It's amazing how much things have changed in the past 15, 20 years. Um, whether or not you use clopidogrel, prasugrel, or ticagalur, we'll, we'll talk about briefly. But again, I could do a whole talk just on that. Um, this is looking at guidelines so that you know these for the boards. What about enoxaparin versus IV heparin? Okay, you can use 1B uh, IV heparin. We should should be the preferred agent, I'll say why, or enoxaparin, okay? That's class 1A, it actually has better data to use class 1A. And I think if you look at this, you could ask yourself, why are we not using enoxaparin over IV heparin? The bottom line is um, in uh, the US today, we're taking most of these patients to cath. In that setting, most operators, myself included, would rather have them IV heparin. It gives me more options about what I can do and how I can monitor it rather than trying to adjust the timing of when they got their last dose of sub-Q enoxaparin, we can deal with it. It's not that we can't, it's just that we favor using IV heparin. If you're going down a conservative treatment, this is clearly the preferred therapy, enoxaparin over IV heparin. It's really a better anticoagulant. We go, won't go into the detail, but it's a better anticoagulant um, for many different reasons. Um, Still, even though it's a 1B versus 1A, this is going to be the preferred strategy unless you know you're going down a conservative management um, strategy. So let's make this simple. Okay, I'm trying to keep it simple. So we'll summarize all this stuff. Put them on aspirin, high dose statin, IV heparin, unless they're you know they're not going to get cath. Um, please use dual antiplatelet therapy, especially if they're positive troponins or ST changes. Those are the Timmy risk score factors that put people at the most high risk really um, trumps everything else. Um, treat their double product abnormalities with beta blocker before calcium channel blocker, but you can use a calcium channel blocker. Their hypertension, again, beta blocker or calcium channel blocker. ACE ARB, unless their creatinine is going up, you can use nitrates too for their blood pressure. There's lots of other things we can use to get their blood pressure down. 
But when I see somebody coming with an ACS and the next morning their heart rate's 90, they're not in heart failure, their heart rate's 92 and they're on 12 and a half BID of metoprolol and their blood pressure's 180 over 90 and they're on, only on 12 and a half BID of metoprolol, it really is poor form. And I think we need to do a better job of thinking about these things that we can keep, things cool, keep people cooled down, treat them appropriately, okay? And rare use of 2B3 inhibitors. Um, and uh, we won't go into the detail of when you would use that. Um, most of the time, we're not using them upfront at all. Sometimes you'll see it used after the fact. If, for instance, we can't get any PO medicine in them or there's a high thrombus burden, sometimes we use them. Don't forget that, yeah. Briefly, 2B3A, this is for the board exam, okay? Again, only high-risk patients if you're going to the cath uh, early invasive, most of the time they're cath lab initiated, um, not upstream. Um, don't use them in your medically treated patients. Talked about avoiding upstream and low-risk patients. Probably shouldn't use it with bivalrudin, um, especially in a setting due antiplatelet where there's no benefit. And obviously beware of relative contraindications. This is for board exam. Also for board exam and beta blockers. First 24 hours, unless they're in heart failure or shock. IV therapy is a class 2A for, high, for hypertension without uh, contraindications. It can be harmful. RAS, what about RAS briefly? So ACE inhibitors, they talk about using the first 24 hours um, in patients with pulmonary congestion or EFs less than 40 but you need to be very cautious. And most data shows that you don't need to use it in the first 24 hours. That's where the most harm is probably gonna come about, especially in the STEMI population by dropping their blood pressure too much. Um, but if after their event, they have low EF, especially if they have hypertension, they really should be put on uh, an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. When you use a long-term aldosterone antagonist, the guidelines say that after you've used the therapeutic dose of ACE inhibitor, you'd hate to sort of keep them on five of lisinopril and are limited by um, hyperkalemia. Um, their EF is less than 40 or symptomatic heart failure or diabetes, and they don't have uh, hyperkalemia or, or significant renal dysfunction. Need to think about this. If we're not using this all that much. I would argue probably appropriately so. I'd rather you maximize your dose of an ACE inhibitor before uh, adding um, Lowernone has the best data um, for spironolactone, but don't forget about this as a possibility, especially when their EF is falling. The data for intensive versus moderate statin therapy is unequivocal. Um, I don't think you can ever really argue this. Um, just use it. So initial anticoagulant, we talked about this briefly, so I won't uh, belabor it too much, but if you're taking an invasive strategy, which again, most people you are, um, you can use an octoparent unfractionated heparin, uh, unfractionated heparin. We like unfractionated heparin if they're going in the next probably day or two, uh, but you can use bivalve too if you need to, level of evidence B. Conservative strategy, definitely an octoparent. We're going to use fondoparent on here. Briefly, I'll talk about uh, dual antiplatelet. Um, I love clopidogrel. It's a cure study. It came out when I was a third year med student back in, or third year resident back in 2001. Overall cohort showed a, a benefit of clopidogrel over placebo, both in the medical treatment, but less so in PCI group and less so in the cabbage group. Um, so median time of usage was nine months. Um, but I think it's important to, if you're using it for folks who don't get a stent, this is probably where it had its biggest benefit, dual antiplatelet patients with stent. If you're using it just for the medical treatment arm, you have to ask yourself, okay, how, how big was the benefit? And, and in this overall study cohort, the absolute risk reduction of an ischemic event was, was, was 2%. But they had an absolute increase in their major bleeding events. Sorry, this is trying to show that. Of 1%. So they're now, uh, terminology in 2020, be their net clinical benefit was only about 1%. That's of all comers, and clearly smaller in the medical treatment group. So you know, we talk about, well, they had a non STEMI, they didn't get cath, we probably should use clopidogrel as well. Well, maybe if they're not high risk for having a bleeding event, but know that the benefit from an ischemic standpoint is pretty daggone small. That's where knowing the data can be helpful. Just, uh, there we go. 
So now we'll talk about Plato, my favorite trial. Um, so this talks about, this is, as you guys know, a randomized controlled trial of Ticagalor versus Clopidogrel that showed that you're saving lives by giving Ticagalor. Um, and I'm sorry if I don't believe that, but, but I don't believe that, but boy, it sure has made it into the guidelines. But uh, to me, it's amazing. And it is the board answer for the preferred antiplatelet. It has a, clearly has a more rapid absorption than Clopidogrel. It's a more potent P2Y12 inhibitor. Um, but the data, if we really critically look at the Plato data, I'm briefly just gonna say I'm skeptical of it. Um, why? Briefly, the North American cohort, 1,800 patients, so about a tenth of the total patients. There was a trend, a pretty strong trend, towards Ticagalor being inferior to Clopidogrel. We don't talk about that now, but for this reason and the fact that um, so many of the positive uh, endpoints occurred in only two countries where there are only 21% of the patients, i.e. Poland and Hungary, initially the FDA didn't approve this medicine. Um, and I think it's um, for us to not remember this uh, is a little concerning to me. And yes, uh, what is a contrarian? I'm definitely a contrarian in this in this um, sort of area. Uh, I looked up the definition this morning, a person who goes rejects popular opinion and this has nothing to do with stock exchange trade dealing. It has to do with uh, guideline directed medical therapy. Um, but I think we should be very skeptical of, of the Plato data. I'm happy to talk more about it to anybody who wants to, to, to to talk about it later, but we don't have time to go further than this. I will refer you to the ISO React 5 trial. Um, uh, this is, as you guys know, the ISO group is a group out of Germany that does a lot of good work. Sometimes their data is underpowered, um, but this was a trial done recently, just published last year, you guys probably know about, um, where their um, hypothesis was that they would show the Ticagalor was superior to Prasagril um, in ACS patients. And in fact, it wasn't, it was inferior. Um, so they powered it to show superiority and it was inferior, just Ticagalor, inferior to Prasagril, but absolute risk reduction of ischemic events at 2.4% and no difference in major bleeding. I don't know why we don't talk about this uh, more often, but um, I don't know if we talk about this in journal club either. If not, we, we should, I can't remember. But guidelines, cheat sheet, Here's what they want. If you're taking the boards tomorrow, this is what you need to know. For elective PCI, yes, clopidogrel, no prasigrel, no ticagrelor. For STEMI, you can use any of those three. STEMI lytics, currently only clopidogrel. There has been some recent data with ticagrelor. It hasn't made it into the guidelines. How about non-STEMI? Um, invasive, use, you can use clopidogrel, prasigrel, or ticagrelor. You can't technically not supposed to pretreat with prasigrel. Um, because the trial wasn't done as such. Um, if you've taken a conservative uh, therapy, we've never used Prasagrel for that, but um, using Clopidogrel or Ticagrel is okay. Triple therapy, I would not check that box. Um, and then this concept of surgery early after um, PCIs, uh, they recommend switching to Clopidogrel. I think basically that we need to talk about that further about how to uh, approach that. These are current guidelines based on uh, using the Plato data. In short, uh, non-STEMI, I just want to remind you again that it's okay to go down either one of these paths. Most of the time, we're going to be going down an early invasive strategy. Now that you know the data behind it, if there's a reason not to go down this path, again, there's lots of different reasons, age, renal dysfunction, questionable symptoms, just left AMA last night. Um, you know, it's, you're not hurting people if there's a reason to go down that ischemia guided strategy. That doesn't mean you may not offer them a cath at some point in the future. It just means you kind of have to prove that you need to, basically. So briefly, uh, key points I'd like you to try and remember. Um, that to please determine whether the patient's symptoms are related to acute ischemia from obstructive coronary disease. That is the nuance. That is the art of being a cardiologist and being on a cardiology rotation is trying to figure that out. I'm not saying it's always easy. I'm not saying you, saying you always know the answer, but taking the time to try and tease that out is critically important. Partly because there are lots of people, especially as we get older, who have obstructive coronary disease. That is not the question. That is not the question. Okay. 
And actually, their risk factors don't help much in this determination. That's been shown over and over again. The Timmy risk score doesn't help much in this determination. We have tried to come up with, with uh, algorithmic uh, scores that can help. The Timmy risk score is not very helpful. So the heart score is something we can talk about. Um, and then there's a new score that just came out from some cardiologists in New Mexico. It's actually kind of interesting. Um, helps to sort of screen out larger populations. Um, look over the new definitions uh, and this slideshow, it has the, the, the reference in there. You can look at it, but that's a really good article that steps you through and I, I think it's very helpful. Um, recognize high risk scenarios in our non STEMI patients and act accordingly. In other words, there's, there's a fair number of patients that we need to cap sooner rather than later. Uh, and those are the high risk um, folks um, and you need to know who they are and you need to be more aggressive in those folks. Med treatment involves not just antiplatelets, usually do antiplatelet, anticoagulants and double product reducers, don't forget those. Again, invasive strategy usually preferred but should not be an automatic decision. You're not harming people by choosing a selective strategy if there are reasons to do so. This is where the risk factor score systems can be helpful. After you've made a definition, after you've made a diagnosis and you're trying to decide high, how high risk this person is for an event to occur, that's where your Timmy and Gray scores can be helpful. That's where you use them, not in making the diagnosis of their presenting symptom. And that's it. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. Uh, we enjoyed the talk a lot. I'll open it up to see if anybody has any questions.